Good afternoon, uh, friends, and welcome to this. And it's a, such a delight to see so many people here today. It's rather an unusual time for, for such a meeting. So thank you indeed, very much indeed for, for coming to join us today. Um, and a particular welcome to Haifa Rashad, who is going to be our chair, Clark, for the day and Catherine West, um, who is our speaker. Um, Haifa is uh, from the North London area meeting, and among many roles, I'm sure, she's also clerk to the Engaging Young Adult Quakers Steering Group. So we're very pleased and, and grateful to you, Haifa, for, for coming along today. My name is Mick Langford, I'm clerk to the QSS, and it falls to me to make some housekeeping sort of announcements. Uh, the, the talk will, and, and the questions and answers will um, go on until about half past one, but I'm asked to ensure that the whole room is emptied by two o'clock so that the staff can arrange um, the, the room for another event that's taking place today. Um, so for health and safety reasons, we have to be, be out of here by two o'clock. I'm sure you've all have turned your telephones off or put them into flight mode. I'm afraid I can't do an impression of a telephone ringing, but if you could just uh, make sure that that is the case. And as far as uh, fire, well, the possibility of fire, and I'm sure there isn't one, but we have to say that um, there are no planned fire, fire drills or alarms today, so if the alarm does go off, it's for real, and um, we are asked to vacate the building by the well-signed exits here, and apparently that, that one leads straight out onto the street, but we are asked to gather in the garden at, at the front of the building, should, should that be necessary. Um, that's about all I have to say, except to say that uh, at the end of the meeting, I've got some notices, so don't go away. I've got some notices. Um, so with that, I leave it to Haifa to commence the meeting and to introduce, introduce Catherine to you. Thank you very much. So I'm very happy to introduce this year's Salcher lecturer, Catherine West, not least because I am one of her constituents. Catherine is the Labour Member of Parliament for Hornsey and Wood Green in North London. Prior to being elected to Parliament in 2015, Catherine was leader of Islington Council, where she set up the country's first Fairness Commission, chaired by Professor Richard Wilkinson co-author of The Spirit Level. Catherine West became a Quaker in the 1990s and is a member of North West London Area Meeting. She gave the Swarthmore Lecture in 2017 on the topic of faith in politics, a testimony to equality. Quaker testimonies inform Catherine's politics. Amongst many causes, she has been a prominent spokesperson in campaigns for nuclear disarmament, for the better treatment of asylum seekers, and for the UK remaining in the EU. The theme of Catherine's lecture today will be Solutions for a Divided Society. After nine years of severe austerity, social and economic inequality is rising, and British society is increasingly divided. Catherine will suggest some basic solutions for our communities, which could make a real difference and bring people back together. Catherine will speak for about 30 minutes, followed by some plenty of time for reflections and questions and discussion. As is customary at yearly meeting, we will start and finish in silence, upholding Catherine, and Catherine will speak when she is ready.
Good afternoon, friends. It's lovely to be here, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Haifa. And I hope Haifa, as somebody who works for Unison Trade Union across the road, will help when it comes to some of the question and answers, because I'm sure she'll have lots of facts and figures at her fingertips. And it is a real honour to give this year's Salter Lecture. And the books about Ada Salter are right here. If you haven't got a copy, please um, purchase one. It's a lovely book, a fantastic read, and everything you need to know about solutions for a divided society. And last year, of course, our uh, friend, Molly Scott Cato, MEP, uh, spoke about the peace argument for remaining in the European Union, and it's a real honour to follow her uh, in giving the Salter Lecture today. So the focus of my speech is not on Brexit, but it would be impossible to talk about solutions for a divided society without speaking its name, particularly in the light of yesterday's polling day. The 2016 referendum split the population in two, and the ensuing negotiations have laid bare the inadequacies of the parliamentary process. And it would be easy for me, as someone who voted and campaigned for remaining in the European Union, to wish that the whole thing had never happened. But to do so would really be to deny Brexit's political salience and to ignore the context of austerity as a driver which gave the debate between the Leave camp and the Remain camp its edge in 2016. And many who voted to leave did as a response to unfettered inequality, in my view, and as a rejection of those who appeared to defend the status quo and neoliberalism as we know it. The high number of Leave voters in the regions outside London, particularly in the north of England, really to me couldn't be a clearer statement of that fact. And in the decades since the financial crisis, advanced economies have been disappointing on many fronts. The government's choice to bail out banks and to keep interest rates artificially low for a decade exposed the myth of the self-sustaining free market. The continual concentration of wealth and power in the city of London has alienated a huge chunk of the country, and the infighting and squabbling in the House of Commons has only served to exacerbate disillusionment. But I fear, however, that if we do leave the European Union, the same people who are disenchanted with politics may stand to, leave, to lose the most economically and culturally. Two years ago, as Haifa mentioned, I delivered the Swarthmore Lecture, which I wrote with my friend, Councillor Andy Hull, and our thesis was that inequality is bad for everyone, not only undermining important human notions of worth, self-esteem and respect, but it's also economically damaging. Unequal societies tend to be less trusting, have higher incidents of violence and suffer more from poor mental health. Andy and I dedicated the lecture to the work of Joe Cox, a Labour MP and a friend and colleague who was assassinated by a white supremacist for what he appeared to be failing to put Britain first, when what Joe wanted to do was to make her country a better place for everyone. Joe's legacy, embodied by the statement that we have far more in common than the things which divide us, resonates with a Quaker sense of inclusivity. And since Joe's death, the world has become a great many more, and many more tragedies have been fueled by hatred. I wish to pay tribute to the victims of those senseless killings across various societies and cultures and also think of the families and friends, because the deep thread running through all of this is that division and inequality do not help to solve problems, they hinder them by breeding contempt and fear. A little bit about myself, Haif has already introduced me, but I originally studied languages and worked with asylum seekers for whom English, English was not the first language then working as a caseworker for David Lammy MP in Tottenham, and then becoming a local authority councillor and borough leader, and now a Labour MP. And 
the insight and the privilege that it is to be an elected member and for so many people to trust you with their stories is the thing which gives a real drive to this work of tackling inequality. The same problems time and again, and I had a busy advice surgery this morning before arriving. Housing need, money worries, and a lack of access to secure employment being the top three. And it's been my desire throughout my career to see politics address the needs of deprived and disadvantaged communities and address the scourge of low pay and the blight of pensioner poverty. Today I wish to put forward three solutions, just because I didn't want to speak for the whole hour because I want to hear your feedback. Three solutions, so I'm going to address housing, wages and the epidemic of knife crime. So having an affordable, stable home in 21st century Britain should be a given. And we know from the work of Quaker Homeless Action and others, many of you are probably working in this yourselves, we're faced with a housing crisis of epic proportions. Not only is it the result of a highly unequal society, it also reinforces that inequality. The tragedy of the preventable Grenfell fire in one of London's wealthiest boroughs is a stark reminder of the glaring gap between the haves and have-nots. Several years later, many tenants still remain without secure housing, despite that high-profile tragedy. And since 2010, in England alone, homelessness has risen by 60% and rough sleeping has risen by 134%. And we know at Friends House that there's a lot of day-to-day -day work done with rough sleepers here to try and connect them into Streetlink and other groups which help with rough sleeping. In the same period, the rise in the cost of renting privately has surged ahead of wage growth. There are 1.2 million people on the social housing waiting list, but fewer than 6,000 homes were built last year. The government spending £12 million on a luxury New York apartment for a British diplomat to live in while he negotiates trade deals with the US is rather a contrast to those sleeping rough or who have been on social housing waiting lists for years. No deal Brexit planning has cost £1.4 billion, enough capital if spent correctly to provide thousands of social homes. And at the heart of the housing crisis is the overall lack of supply, it's quite simple, and an increasing reliance on expensive, insecure and unregulated private rented accommodation in privately rented homes. But it doesn't need to be this way. There are some simple things, some simple solu solutions to this divided situation which we could put into place very quickly. Not just building more council homes, but offering secure long-term tenancies. In the past, people rented for a short time in the private sector before either being able to purchase a home or being uh, accepted on the social housing waiting list. But now there are millions of families for whom living in a privately rented accommodation will be bringing up their families for life. And of course, at any time, a landlord can give notice and then sell the property or um, go on and do other things with that property, thereby taking away the home of a family. And that's why the government really needs to take a long-term commitment to not just more affordable homes, because that will take time, but also to reforming the privately rented sector. One of my constituents was faced with a desperate situation recently. The council had tried to locate her and her disabled child hundreds of miles away from London in Telford in Shropshire, because of the lack of affordable housing op options in the borough. And some of you who are familiar with the situation will be aware that the housing rates which boroughs can house people in in, social ho in privately rented homes has changed. And most housing in London doesn't fit into that category, which is why the borough was seeking accommodation outside London. This would have been away from the child's hospital and all of the constituent support networks. Fortunately, we won the battle and kept that constituent and her child in their home borough. But sadly, her case is not unique. My caseworkers and I frequently have to keep vulnerable constituents in Hornsey and Wood Green from being pushed out of London 
to areas where there's more, albeit affordable homes, but low cost and insecure. It comes back to the same thing about supply, more supply of affordable housing being desperately needed. As the Mayor of London has said, we need four times the current annual government funding for genuinely affordable homes. That's in the capital. It would be less outside of London. There also need to be changes in the law to allow councils to buy up land more cheaply and reforms to private tenancy to give tenants a security of tenure and to stop landlords from hiking up rents way above wage levels, wage increases. The other thing which could be much more effectively used is the basic visiting of any homes which are procured through a public provider, whether that's a social landlord, um, a council which is a landlord, or privately owned homes. Because the conditions that some people are still living in, regardless of London or outside London, are really Victorian in terms of damp, um, very expensive for heating, and yet completely um, wasteful in terms of the, the energy used. And there's much, much more that could be done quite easily and quite cheaply. My second point is on wages, and that obviously links in very closely with the housing question. The concentration of wealth and job opportunities in London creates vast inequalities between the capital and the rest of the UK. Career progression and better paid work is more likely if people move regions, particularly coming to London. And too often towns and other cities do not have the employment infrastructure to ensure career progression, notably in professions like law and accountancy. And obviously, those from wealthier backgrounds are more likely to be able to make that kind of move with the resources and grab those opportunities wherever they may be. And we know from the research of um, both Alan Milburn and then Marta Milburn on social mobility that this continues to be a big social mobility setback, the way that um, the globalised economy has put uh, London and jobs in London far ahead of those in other regions. Devolving power and prestige to local government and combined authorities would be a way to ensure a more even spread of growth and new jobs and would make our economy less reliant on the capital. Meaningful, secure work and a decent wage underpin a fair society. Yet the UK has one of the highest rates of income inequality in Europe. While unemployment is at a 44-year low, in-work poverty is shamefully rampant causing record numbers of households to rely on food banks. Indeed, a record 1.6 million emergency food parcels were given out by the Trussell Trust. Is anybody here involved in a food bank in their neighbourhood? I knew the Quakers would be. <laughs> so the Trussell Trust last year, widely believed to have been the result of benefit cuts, universal credit delays and rising poverty. UK households have experienced flatlining living standards due to a lack of economic and pay growth, and average incomes are not likely to rise materially over the next two years either. This, of course, inextricably linked to the housing crisis. For people on average wages, rent is unaffordable, and getting on the property ladder is almost impossible without recourse to the bank of mum and dad. What's clear is that universal credit has been a total failure. And along with other MPs, and I know Quakers have made representations to parliamentarians on this question, many people are calling for the five week wait for the first payment of universal credit to be scrapped and for benefits to be uprated in line with the cost of living. Because as many here will be aware, benefit rates have been frozen. So as energy bills and other things have gone up, benefit rates have been frozen, which has meant slowly households have been flatlining while the cost of living has been going up. I believe the rollout of universal credit, which will only serve to widen the gap between the rich and poor, should be halted immediately. A cocktail of insecure, low-paid work and stagnant wage growth has pushed millions into a permanently precarious financial position, leading to a consumer debt crisis 
Rather than being about people living beyond their means, as some would have us believe, it's about people whose incomes have been squeezed so tight for so long that they cannot make ends meet, however hard they try. This couldn't be illustrated more clearly than by the fact that national health service workers and council workers are among the biggest users of payday loan companies. And recently, one of the government departments opened a food bank for their own staff. Real wages are lower now than they were in 2010, and nearly 10 million people, a third of the workforce, are in insecure work, characterised by zero-hour contracts. Rather than offering people flexibility and control by allowing employees to choose their own hours to suit their needs, zero-hour contracts put people in a precarious situation where they don't know how much money they will receive from week to week while real wages in the finance sector have grown by as much as £120 a week, average working people are £800 a year worse off than they were in 2010. So in-work poverty is not only morally wrong, but economically illiterate. In 2014, taxpayers spent £11 billion a year topping up low wages paid by UK companies, 11 times the cost of benefit fraud for that year. Rather than attacking benefit claimers, claimants for sponging off the state or not working hard enough, we must hold corporations accountable. There needs to be proper enforcement of national minimum wage as a bare minimum. And one way to do this would be to devolve it from the HMRC, which is rather removed, to local authorities who could visit workplaces and ensure that national minimum, wa national minimum wage payments were being used at, in every workplace in their locality. An even better solution to eliminating in-work poverty would be a commitment from both the private and public sector to pay a living wage to all of its workers. Because a prerequisite of any sustainable industrial strategy should be a resolute rejection of poverty pay. One in five UK workers, over five million people, earn less than the living wage. The living wage, which is £9 an hour in the UK and £10.55 per hour in London, and this is the voluntary living wage that I'm talking about, is independently calculated based on the actual cost of living. Paying a living wage is, as the name suggests, about live, allowing workers to truly live, not just survive. A wage, not a handout, about earning con a contribution, reciprocity, and the dignity of work. As a borough leader, I brought our cleaning team in-house and increased their pay just by paying the voluntary living wage. When I suggested this proposal, no one argued, but when I stated that I would do this by cutting the pay of the chief executive by £30,000, £50,000, a chorus of naysayers erupted to tell me how we would never be able to find a good chief exec at that low wage. Not only is paying employees a living wage the decent thing to do, it's also good for business. According to a study carried out by the Living Wage Foundation, 86% of businesses stated that paying a living wage improved the reputation of their business. 75% said that it increased motivation and retention rates for employees, and 58% said that it improved relations between managers and their staff. Going beyond a living wage, some companies have taken exemplary steps in creating a more egalitarian relationship with their staff. We know about the home entertainment retailer Richer Sounds, which is the latest company to adopt an employee ownership model, following in the footsteps of John Lewis and Riverford Organic Farmers. So by transferring, transferring shares into a trust, Richer Sounds employees, minus the directors, will receive a £1,000 bonus for each year they've worked for the retailer to thank employees for their loyalty and hard work, and to give them a more reciprocal relationship in which they can have their say on the running of the business. And more companies could adopt this model, not only to give workers a financial boost, but to create a less hierarchical working environment and more stability in the workforce. The government should also immediately require all employers to publish their internal pay ratios between the highest and lowest paid as opposed to average paid employees, bringing much needed transparency to the low pay versus high pay debate. 
The political economist Will Hutton has suggested that under normal circumstances, no public sector employer should exhibit an internal pay ratio higher than 1 to 20. When I was a borough leader of an in, uh, inner city um, borough with thousands of employees, we got our differential down to 1 to 11, so it can be done. There's a lot more that Parliament could be doing to ensure that everyone gets a fair wage, starting by publishing internal pay differentials, as I've mentioned, and also paying everyone a living wage would be a huge step towards er eradicating in-work poverty. Supporting businesses to adopt an employee ownership model would also create this. We could also look at ensuring an even spread of new jobs outside the capital so that people don't feel the need to move to London to get a good job. My third point, and finally, is on knife crime. And sadly, this isn't just a problem in our cities, but is increasingly a problem outside London as well. Countries that exhibit high levels of inequality between groups are more likely to experience violent conflict than more equal countries. It's unsurprising, then, that we're in the throes of a knife crime epidemic. After falling for several years, knife crime in England and Wales is rising again. Homicides in the last year rose to their highest level in over a decade, with 732 people killed in England and Wales. Offences involving knives also rose by 6%. Some of the knife crime incidents in the capital have happened in my own constituency, and the impact and the ripple effect on the community has been horrific. I've also received dozens of letters and emails from constituents fearing for their children's lives. And it's a sorry state of affairs when people don't feel safe in communities. And many MPs have been recognising this and working hard in Parliament. But as I said before, it's quite hard to get that message across while the Brexit debate is very loud in our ears. A public health approach to violence has for some time been considered to be a way of tackling the root causes. By analysing the risk factors for committing violent crime, we can see that income inequality is a significant driver for knife carrying. Young people who live in very deprived areas and have few educational or employment opportunities may be less likely to see potential for their future and therefore more vulnerable to claims that crime is an option for achieving status and resources. We're also seeing much more aggressive forms of grooming of children and young people in our high streets and that's across the board. And also, of course, on the internet, on, on people's mobile phones. And we know that there's a link between school exclusion and knife crime. We also know that being at risk of school exclusion or worse, being excluded is detrimental to young people's mental health. It makes young people feel as though the system has given up on them and can make them feel as though all they can do is resort to this life of crime which occasionally is presented in a very glamorous way. A public health approach to violence is preventative rather than focusing on changing just individual behaviour. It's a traditional strategy to tackle violent crime as a community. We've got two examples. One is one from abroad, from the city of Cali in Colombia. And Rodrigo Guerrero, who was a public health specialist, won the 1992 mayoral election on the promise that he would reduce reduce the rising levels of violence, which he did, reducing the homicide rate by 30% between 1994 and 1997. He set up a program in which risk factors for violence were identified, which shaped the priorities for actions. Another part of the program was to provide education on civil rights matters for both the police and the public together, including television advertising at peak viewing times highlighting the importance of tolerance and a community-based approach. Over the course of the program, special projects were set up to provide economic opportunities and safe recreational facilities for young people. Proposals were discussed in consultation with local people and the city administration ensured the continuing participation and commitment of the community. This reduction in the number of homicides allowed the law enforcement authorities to devote scarce resources to com combating more organised forms of crime. Furthermore, public opinion in Cali shifted strongly from a passive attitude towards dealing with violence to a vociferous demand for more prevention activities. And I know from my own work locally that having a school hosting a meeting about knife crime, which is quite a brave thing for schools to do because they don't want to be associated with crime, 
does bring the community together in a very special way. Having 300 families, members of families, young people, parents, grandparents, and having police, mentors, the MP, the head teacher, all saying the same thing and actually talking about it does go some way to having that debate. But I've noticed in my own communities that it's in the more closely knit but poorer communities where it's easier to have that discussion whereas the crime is going across the whole of my constituency and in some of the other areas where people don't want to talk about this, it's still happening, but we find it harder to have those conversations. And so I want to have your views as to how to tackle that one. Closer to home and more recently, Scotland managed to reduce knife crime dramatically by adopting a similar approach. In 2005, Scotland had the second highest murder rate in Western Europe and Scots were more than three times more likely to be murdered than people in England and Wales. Between April 2006 and April 2011, 40 children and teenagers were killed in homicides involving a knife in Scotland. Between 2011 and 2016, that figure fell to just eight. Tougher sentences and stop and search were not behind these dramatic decreases. Rather, these sorts of criminalising measures have been shown to widen the gap between the police and those targeted. And one of the key aims of Scotland's public health approach to violence reduction was to rebuild trust within communities. There's a particular focus as well on hospitals. It's often at accident and emergency when a youngster comes in as a victim of a knife crime that he or she will feel that they can speak to a health professional. So crucially, it was about training up frontline health workers to discuss a decision on the part of a young person to decide to do things differently, to cooperate with police, and to decide to do a different, have a different approach. One of the factors stopping many of the um, investigation of these knife crimes is the lack of willingness of young people to trust the authorities to tell what happened and who is to blame for this, for this violence. The focus in Scotland was on offering routes into employment so that those at risk of knife violence could get their lives back on track. By targeting prevention through education and early years support, we can also address the adverse childhood experiences that define the lives of so many future offenders. Taking heed of lessons learned in Scotland and in concert with Scottish public health experts, the Mayor of London has just launched the Violence Reduction Unit, trying to pick up the best practice and apply that to our boroughs here. It comprises a variety of services and involves communities in part of designing and working towards solutions. The idea is that a healthy, safe start in life for children could save lives by keeping them in a positive educational setting and providing life opportunities. I re recently met with the um, Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, Mr Brokenshire, to discuss with him a specific project just for my own constituency which would look at which children in Year 8 or Year 9 are the most likely to be a victim or a perpetrator of knife crime so that we can put in the resource at that age of 13 or 14 rather than waiting until 17 or 18. Once the child's got to 18, very, very difficult to have an effect. So in conclusion, just as the problems of a divided society are interlinked, so too are its solutions. Striving towards a society in which work is meaningful and offers decent pay is not only a laudable goal in and of itself, but a step towards tackling the disillusionment amongst the workforce which has been proven to be linked, in the case of young people, to knife crime. What we need is bold, transformative and joined up policy making. We need bottom-up approaches. We need to listen to local people. To tackle housing inequality, we must invest in a program of mass social house building, similar to after the Second World War. We must also address income inequality, as I've said about the living wage, and enforcing the national minimum wage as well, and publishing those pay differentials so that we understand that gap between the most wealthy and those on the lowest incomes. And finally, on uh, our public health approach to violent crime, we could cut the number of homicides, but also that crucial ripple effect into our communities, transforming young people's lives 
and giving them hope for a better future. I'd like to thank everybody for listening, and I'm very keen now to have your views on those three areas that I've prioritised. Um, and also just to mention, I'm very aware that as Quakers, many of you are, aware, uh, are either in restorative justice programs with young people or housing inequality or even working on becoming living wage communities. So it would be lovely to hear some examples from your own neighbourhoods as well. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Friends, please do continue to uphold Catherine and one another as we open the space to offer reflections and questions. There are people with roving microphones on hand, so please, um, if you wish to offer a question or reflection, either stand if you're able or raise a hand and do wait for the microphone to come to you. I see a question behind you there. Um, thank you very much for covering so much ground with, with so many interesting ideas. You mentioned at the end the need for bold and transformative policies. I would like to see a government commit to bringing house prices back into a sensible relationship with incomes. Um, when I was a young adult, house, housing costs were maybe 25% of income and now they're often 50%. And until that changes, people won't have the ability to pay the taxes that we need for better public services. I think this is more than a, just about increasing supply, it's about changing the tax treatment of housing, um, it's about managing the supply of mortgages, it's a whole suite of policies that need to be brought together with a 10-year plan to get that ratio back down to something that's affordable for both um, house buyers and house renters. Thank you. I'll take a couple more questions. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear. Yes. Is that better? Yes. I always wonder whether the de debate on income would be helped by bringing up two sets of figures at once not just averages, but also median. Because I understand that at the moment, the average in the UK is somewhere like 25 or 26,000, while the median is more like 20,000. And I think that decision makers and those who influence decisions quite often lose sight of of the reality for the vast majority. They, um, it, the, a recent survey of middle class people thought that the average would be about 40,000 because they were taking themselves as the normal sort of income level. And I think most of us know that 40,000 is about double the median at least. Thank you. Thank you, friend. Um, I see another hand here to my left. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, in, your, um, in your talk, you did mention in one stage the austerity measure. Austerity measure is not to punish that population, and no political party want that to be uh, to be put themselves into danger, that making that population enemy. Some people believe it is the World War III, the worldwide uh, economic crashes, uh, and it is all the economy created by the people artificially, uh, imaginary. It goes for the time being, and gradually it crashes, and and until another another system develop, whole country is developing another system, and um, to 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 survive for next hundred years. So it is, uh, it is any any political party will be uh, in a position. They have to do. They have to follow the austerity measure. After World War, that austerity measure during 
wartime, austerity measure, that is uh, very vital. It is not any political decision. It is the who is, has the depth study of the human population and the how the human society and economy goes down either in natural calamities or economical downfall all over the world. So possibly you can give some clue because of you did mention that offset measure and um, that uh, that uh, uh, conservative government that brought about to punish the or to uh, or to make the people unhappy. Uh, so any better idea you have got about that that without austerity measure we can we can survive for our, uh, for that 50 years thank you i'll pass to catherine to respond great thank you haifa so on the house prices question i mean this is crucial because a lot of people are on these low wages um and therefore this feeling of not being able to get onto the housing ladder is um, one of the things which uh, you know, affects many, many different groups of people. Um, and sometimes people say to me, well, um, we should change the model and everybody should just be able to rent. But even that idea currently is not possible because renting is so expensive as well. I think it'd be different if we had this big supply of genuinely affordable homes to rent people will feel happy, but um, I think it's just we're running out of options. Um, and that's why, really, we need to tackle the privately rented sector at the same time as trying to build more homes, at the same time as reforming the planning system, which, because um, a lot of the property developers tend to hold on to the land for a very long time. They tend, in the press, to blame local authorities for failing to pass planning applications. But if you look at the figures, local authorities are passing them just you know, at the rate that they've always been passing them, but there are large amounts of land just sitting there. And the other thing is when a property developer begins to um, design and then sell off homes, it's only done in a very sort of controlled way so that they can make sure that they get the top dollar for their development. So the friend who mentioned it is quite right to say that we need to look at that whole sort of picture, including um, you know, the mortgage provision, including tax treatment of properties, and including the way that the housing supply is sort of eked out, so that it's always in desperate need, therefore we always have to pay the top price for it. Um, and those of us who have been involved in planning over the years at local authority level all know the way that this works. It's very slow, so that the demand is always really intense, so that people will put every single penny that they have into these new homes. Um, and that's the way that our planning system um, is really sort of on the side of the developer, much more than after the Second World War, we had an incredible crisis because so many homes had been bombed. The government just had to get involved and build more social homes. Um, and some of them were thrown up and the consequences, consequences of that for um, social housing providers is quite clear because some of the condition of the properties is quite poor. But I think what we're lacking now is the urgency to tackle it in the way that we did post Second World War. Because obviously you could see the devastation, it was terrible, but there's so many symptoms of that same level of crisis, whether it's the rough sleeping, whether it's you know people in their 40s still paying extortionate amounts of rent and still being on this flat wage structure. Um, and you know, we just need to be able to recognise those symptoms and see that we have to tackle that around the housing supply issue, but it was also at the same time as all those other measures. Um, otherwise, we are going to end up with a real sense of a loss of hope um, and also a sense of transient populations. So many people have to move home so regularly that it's stopping us from building up the communities which we need to. Um, on the question of average and medium incomes, just to give you one example to um, impress upon um, friends here, um, when I was first employed as a caseworker um, for an MP for David Lammy back in um, 2000 after he was elected following a by-election, um, I was shocked to realise when I was appointing a caseworker myself, 19 years later, I'm still offering the same amount of money. <laughs> 
Um, and it's just that that's just an average job. It's a sort of a, but you know, it requires somebody prob probably with a degree or experience in some kind of advice work. And it just does show that, you know, 19, 20 years later, there's still that same amount in basically a public sector work. And it's considered to be a really good job, but it's not, you know, it's not well paid. And I think your other point really is that decision makers are used to being on high incomes. They just are out of touch with most people who are living on, you know, minimum wage. Minimum wage is about seventeen to eighteen thousand a year. I'm looking at Haifa here, who works for Unison. Um, and recently, when I was doing some door knocking for um, the Peterborough by-election, actually, I was chatting to a, a guy who said, "Look, we're both on minimum wage jobs. We're in our late thirties. Probably going to be in those jobs forever, and we're on thirty thousand as a household. And we just cannot make ends meet." You know, and I think it's that trying to kind of work out, because also from a time point of view, if you have children and you're working full time, then there's all these other costs around childcare, around other things. And, um, you know, I think people really are at breaking point. Um, yeah. And finally, on the cyclical nature of um, these banking crashes and the fact that the cycles come round again um, from our friend here, there's no doubt that they do come in cycles, but there's also no doubt that governments can do something about it. Um, and you know, the fact that a government can spend 1.4 billion on no deal preparation um, tells me that that money can be spent on capital for housing, or it can be spent on you know, our hospitals, or it can be spent on our children's schools, um, or providing proper, um, universal credit provision so that we don't have to have people in food banks. So I think it's about priorities and it's about um, what kind of priorities we elect people to put in um, and using the political system which we have to encourage more hope and more of a sense of focusing on people rather than on um, debates about obscure ideas which sadly are not progressing us any further. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. We have time for more questions or reflections. Okay. Um, I have one to my right. Hi. Um, it's maybe a comparatively minor point, but uh, one of the worst aspects, I think, about universal credit, which I know from personal experience, is that uh, it makes planning for people on universal credit completely impossible. And I think it shows what a by intention a punitive system it is. And everything that we would encourage people to do, plan for your future, be sensible, uh, you know, know what you're going to do in the future, etc. that becomes impossible for people on universal credit. Um, they won't tell you from one month to the next what you will be getting on universal credit. And it could be 50p or it could be more, but it, for a lot of people, they simply cannot plan, mm -hmm. which I think for uh, a mature country is, and we try to bring children up uh, with, with economically, being economically savvy, is totally counterproductive and, you know, appalling, really. Thank you. Um, I'll take one more right up the back. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you from talking about knife crime, about the role that you think uh, drug policy reform could possibly mm -hmm. play in that. I think we've seen um, in terms of county lines and the issues that that's brought, and in terms of broader um, racial disparity in how drug offences are treated, and in the way that they damage um, trust between certain communities and the police. Could legalisation or just decriminalisation or just a different approach to how we um, treat drug offences play a role in tackling the knife crime epidemic that you talked about? On the universal credit point, um, I completely agree about the planning because when constituents come to see me, they have their mobile phone and they just show me a list of amounts that they've received and they're all different. 
Um, and I think this sort of need to keep updating and things. And also, I feel very strongly that taking people out of the whole universal credit sort of interviewing system is really inhuman and really lacking in compassion because not even the benefit agency people can really tell them. It goes all through the computer and I feel this is a really strong reason as to why we have so many people who are homeless because a lot of people just can't, can't cope with that everything being mechanised in that way, everything being sort of on a computer screen. Even though we think everybody's got a phone these days, actually I think for a lot of people with um, either dyslexia or language problems, they just can't cope and they get these notices, your universal credit will be cut. And then when it does get cut, I think then they don't know what to do and they sort of freeze. Um, and that's when we get start getting the advice about you're going to lose your home. And I see new people who are on the streets who I think do not look like they've been sleeping rough for a long time, but they just obviously in a terrible situation with universal credit. And it's what you're saying about planning, but it's also the fact that everything has to go through this big sort of um, computer system. I'm not at all against the use of a calculator or whatever, but I think just palming off people into a sort of system where it's just on a computer, when actually what people need is a human being to listen to and to talk to. Um, and I think that's really clear from all the research that's being done on loneliness, that loneliness can actually be really bad for your health. And I know that that's what, what's happening with a lot of our homeless population. There is literally nobody to speak to in the day and nobody to speak to about problems. Um, and people often tell me when they come to my surgery, which is every second Friday at the library, that I'm the only person who still provides actual face-to-face -face interview time. Um, and I know that GPs say the same thing that they're the only people who will give 10 minutes to somebody. And that's part of the reason, I think, why we're seeing GPs very overworked. Um, and the fact that a lot of them are retiring early and so on, because the nature of the work is so intense and the problems are so complex. Because in the old days, you would have had four or five different offices that people could go to, sit down, get their problems sorted out. And now with universal credit, it's just so lacking in any sort of compassion or humanity. Um, and that five-week wait, I mean, how would we feel if we just didn't have an income for five weeks? I, I don't think I could cope. Um, and so, you know, if you add all that up, it's, I'm sure it's contributing to the suicide rate going up. I'm sure of it. Um, I've had one disabled um, resident say to me that, you know, if they put her onto universal credit, she's not gonna wait for it. She's just gonna take her own life. I mean, you know, people are desperate. And that's because of this system, which just completely lacks any humanity to it whatsoever. Um, now, um, on the question of the knife crime, um, very true on um, uh, the sort of racial profiling of knife crime. I had a meeting myself as two Haringey MPs, myself and David Lammy, went to see the National Crime Agency. and. That was some time before the head of the National Crime Agency, Lynn Owers, came out and basically said that crime related to drugs is out of control. And when the National Crime Agency head admits that on public television, that's really worrying. Um, we've all kind of known that as MPs because we see a lot of that in our surgeries, a lot of mothers coming in and saying, my son's in jail, I didn't know that he had anything to do with drug dealing. but. Some of the ways that young people are being groomed is so sophisticated um, and it's not, obviously you mentioned the racial profiling, but it's not just a certain type of young person, it's, it's really networked, it's everybody. Um, this thing that young people get told, which is um, make your five pounds into 50 pounds overnight. Like that is so tempting for a young person. And that is what's happening. They're being groomed in you know, McDonald's in the high street um, and then there, as you say, the county lines, and it's all around the drug trade. And of course, we know that the end consumers of drugs are often well-off people who buy expensive class A drugs. So, you know, I think that there's a very big debate to be had there, and I think we need to have it in parliament, and then we need to make some decisions. Um, it's not an easy one, because the messaging that you send is really important on drugs to young people. So, and also think everybody's watching very carefully what's happening in Canada, where they've um, basically decriminalized um, cannabis to some degree. 
and everybody's watching to see what's the impact of that on things like crime rates, on you know family life, on young people. Um, and But it is the sort of debate that we desperately need to have. Um, but as I mentioned before, anything that doesn't start with B and ends with T doesn't get debated in Parliament. And therefore, no legislation's coming forward and nothing is actually moving. Um, but certainly, you know, looking again at how we tackle drug-related crime is crucial. We have time for more questions, so I see a hand here to my left. No, if you wait, sorry, if you wait for the microphone, it's an access issue. Thank you, hi. Thank you, uh, Nat. Um, um, yeah, uh, oh, hello, yeah, uh, Nat. Um, so that was a very interesting perspective. Thank you. And I would like to ask you, in terms of the context of disconnection from nature, a violent system that we live in, sharing the buildings that we would already have, land and power redistribution um, within communities and a new systemic model of democracy, um, uh, and models like community land trusts and so on where everybody's responsible for producing sustainably and sharing and caring. How much do you think we have um, a complete systemic issue and we need total sort of review and reorganisation systemically of democracy? Well, that's a very big question. Um, <laughs> I would like to stop having referenda, that's for sure, um, because the way that our parliamentary system has built up over a long period of time, um, it doesn't deal with binary questions well. It, the way that we work in parliament is you have a concept which comes in through a legislation and at the first reading you have quite an open debate about the principles behind an idea and then at second reading you obviously amend them and you get into committees which are proportional to parliament and then you debate amendments and you try and improve the original idea and you take soundings from a whole lot of different people and that's where for example your parliamentary officer at Quakers would come and speak to people about speak to parliamentarians about say let's say the domestic violence bill which is meant to be going through soon which is really slow um, and you know you get experts in from women's refuges and they advise and they say here's some suggested wording and they really kind of hone the legislation um, and then obviously you have committee stage where it's debated again and then third reading and normally you know then you have your votes so that you feel as though you can represent your constituents on the matter in principle and also on all the different amendments which come up so that's right. I think that it's quite a good system in terms of the deliberative nature of it. Um, what I worry about, though, is when the thing which that process is being asked to address is a referendum, which is a binary thing, because no amount of legislation, and we've tried, can fit the binary nature of the question. So it's like the exam question and you're meant to write an essay when it's really multiple choice. And so no amount of essay writing gets you into... And I think some of the promises around referenda are really um, difficult with our system. So um, if we were going to go more towards a direct democracy system, I think it would lead to more unhappiness because it would raise an expectation about a yes, no answer to everything, which I think is really difficult to achieve. And I think that the deliberative nature of legislation where you can break into smaller groups and actually discuss things, yes, you might have to vote on them, but there is quite a lot of negotiation which goes on within those deliberative processes. Because um, I feel the direct democracy route is very problematic, and I think we've seen that with the Brexit debate where by definition, half the country will be upset with the outcome. 
Um, and I feel that the parliamentary system, while not perfect, and particularly the way that we sit, where it's two swords difference between us and the other side, um, and some of you will have seen that if you've visited Parliament. The reason that the House of Commons is that bit of green carpet in between the two front benches, it's because it's exactly two swords on either side difference. It's very combative, but some of the good cross-party work actually happens in the committees and in the committee of the whole house. Um, you don't necessarily get the full participation that you do in, you know, when the voting lobbies happen. But I think um, depending on what the question is, um, you can have quite interesting debates. And I think if you're getting good advice, you know, from, say, women's refuges as for domestic violence or from the Quakers if it was about a charity issue or whatever the particular question is, um, then I think you can come up with some really good legislation. My problem is more about, we ha it's not that we haven't got good legislation on the law books, it's that we haven't resourced often the enforcement of that legislation. So with the domestic abuse bill, for example, which is going to be coming through Parliament shortly, we have the most fantastic advice from Women's Aid and all these places. But I just know that unless we resource the police, more women are going to get killed by violent partners. Um, so, you know, I think it's all about matching the resource to the implications of the legislation. Um, that might not be um, answering your question completely. But I'm around later, so Ned, please come and find me. Cause, um, but I feel going towards a direct democracy situation, unless we institute what Switzerland has, which is a debate in committees before you put the referendum, so everybody knows the cost of something, everybody knows the implications of something, everybody knows exactly what they will get if they do vote yes or no on this particular thing, then I feel it's just raising an expectation which is very, very difficult to meet. And that's how you get some of the scenes that we've seen in our town centres and outside Parliament, which have been very violent and not very quakerly, because I think people have been led to believe that our Parliament can give them something which is very difficult to, to provide. Thank you, Catherine. Um, unfortunately, friends, we've come to the close of the lecture time today. Um, but I'd like to give a massive thanks to Catherine for all the food for thought that she's given us. And we'll continue looking at some of these issues throughout yearly meeting as we reflect on our own privilege. Um, I will pass over to Mick for some announcements. Yes, thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Haifa, for chairing the meeting. Uh, just a, one or two little notices. Um, the AGM of, of the Quaker Socialist Society takes place this afternoon at three o'clock in the um, St Pancras Church Hall, which is nearby, but is not the church itself or close to the church. Um, we did send out notices to QSS members by email, those on email, um, to, to show you where the new venue is, uh, which is in Lansing Street, which is off Eversholt Street, next to the Euston Station, so it's not far away. But we do have maps also if people want to go and they've not had um, uh, that previous email giving directions. So Alison has them over there. Um, so we're hoping at the AGM to start a discussion about the section, uh, chapter 23, social responsibility, in, which is in Quaker faith and practice, um, given the fact that faith and practice is now in the, in the, in, in the process of re review. We feel that QSS may have something interesting to say to that chapter of, of faith and practice, but in that debate, that may also say something to QSS about the, the, our future and, and our future direction and where we should be um, working in the future. Um, there are um, membership leaflets knocking about in the room if you've not already had the opportunity to, to get one. If you can't get one today, we are at the group fair on Sunday when we will 
uh, have membership leaflets and uh, other publications available. Um, and there are copies available now, and there will be on at the group fair of Graham Taylor's wonderful book about Ada Salter, um, from whom the um, title of our uh, talks, um, well, Ada and Alfred Salter, um, are taken. Um, so if you want to purchase a copy of that book, we will be at the group fair, but they're also available here at £10. Um, and just to say also that um, copies of the talk will be available uh, through our newsletter when we are able to do that, which you can have online or uh, hard copies. And hopefully it will be on our website, or the, 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 the talk will be on our website and will find its way to YouTube, no doubt. Thank you very much indeed for attending today. It's so gratifying to see so many people here um, today at this fairly inconvenient hour, and I'm sorry that we have to cut short what was promising to be a very interesting debate. But Catherine, did you say you'll be around for a little while? Uh, yeah, so, um, and, and no doubt people will want to discuss the um, themes raised then. So thank you for coming, and do enjoy yearly meeting. Thank you.